Microsoft is one of the most successful tech companies in history, and it only took two decades before it turned Bill into the world's wealthiest man. Like another Silicon Valley success story, part of the tale took place in a Harvard dorm. And just like Facebook's founder, Bill's main priority also wasn't completing his college degree. Instead, he dropped out and focused on bigger things, and we can assume it's a decision he hasn't regretted. Curious to find out how this college dropout went on to disrupt the computer industry and learn some valuable business lessons along the way? Then make sure to keep watching. Bill Gates was born on October 28, 1955. Born into a successful family, he was encouraged from a young age to be competitive. His father, William Gates, was a prominent lawyer and his mother, Mary Maxwell Gates, served on the board of directors for First Interstate Bank System and the United Way. As a child, Bill would spend countless hours reading books, and from the very get-go, it was clear that he was extremely intelligent. But as is usually the case in life, he also benefited from his fair share of dumb luck. In 1968, Bill was an 8th grader, and he attended a private middle school in Seattle called Lakeside. That year, his school invested $3,000 in a state-of-the-art computer. The bright and curious Bill decided to join the computer club, and he was instantly hooked. He racked up countless hours on the machine, learning how to program through trial and error. And at just 13 years old, he eventually wrote his very first software program. Doing this at such a young age is, of course, impressive, but this is also where the dumb luck comes in. In the 1960s, the chances of a 13-year-old kid having access to a computer were pretty much one in a million. Few colleges had computer labs, and a middle school with a computer was definitely unheard of. Had Bill's school not purchased one, he might never have discovered his love for computer programming. During his time at Lakeside, Bill also met a fellow computer geek, Paul Allen, and together the two would begin hacking all sorts of programs. While Bill was a true genius when it came to computers, the same couldn't be said about his flirting skills. So, to help him a little, the two boys hacked into the school scheduling software and signed him up for all girls' classes. Paul did the computer scheduling with me, Bill once said in an interview. Unfortunately for him, he was two years ahead of me, and he was off to college by then. So I was the one who benefited by being able to have the nice girls at least sit near me. It wasn't that I could talk to them or anything, but they were there. He also added, I think I was particularly inept at talking to girls. When I went off to college, I was a little bit more sociable, but I was always below average when it comes to talking to girls. Later, Bill also tried to hack a major company, but he was caught and had to give up computers for an entire year. But of course, he didn't stay away forever. During his time in high school, he began using his skills to do good, and he computerized the school's payroll system together with some friends. But little did anyone know, this was just the mere beginning of a journey that would propel him to astronomical success. After graduating from high school in 1973, Bill enrolled at the prestigious Harvard College. His parents had always hoped he would one day become a lawyer, like his dad. Bill was willing to give it a shot, but it didn't take long before he realized that a career in law was not at all what he wanted. It wasn't his passion, and instead, he took several computer science classes and spent a lot of time on the computers. But while these classes interested him much more, he actually had his eyes set on something bigger. He wanted to turn his hobby into a career, and two years into his education, he took a leave of absence and eventually dropped out entirely. Sure, he didn't get a diploma, but dropping out was anything but a rash decision. You see, during his time at Harvard, Bill had developed a version of the basic programming language. For the first microcomputer, the Altair 8800, and in a 1984 interview, he explained his decision. It was really the, 
urgency to get out there and be the first one to, to put a, a basic on the microcomputer that caused me to drop. Bill had seen the potential for the microcomputer, and he feared missing out on a big opportunity. And after his initial success, he now felt ready to branch out even further. He wanted to devote himself to developing a new company, and he wanted to do it now. He teamed up with his former schoolmate, Paul Allen, and together they founded Microsoft. The company would prove to be highly successful, and within years, Bill became an internationally known entrepreneur. But let's rewind a bit. How exactly did he even end up with such a big task like developing a programming language for the very first microcomputer? Well, the overachiever that he was, Bill had bitten off more than he could chew, and his first big break essentially came from telling a lie. But while this may sound like a bad idea to many, it was a decision he would not regret. Bill and Paul first read about the Altair 8800 in 1975, and they immediately understood that the price of computers would soon drop to the point that selling software for them would be a profitable business. At the time, BASIC was a popular programming language used on large computers, and Bill believed that adapting it to the new microcomputers would be a hole in the market. To see if this plan would work, he contacted Altair's inventor, Ed Roberts. He told him they were developing an interpreter for his microcomputer, and asked whether he would like to see a demonstration. Ed agreed, but there were a couple of problems. The boys had neither an interpreter nor an Altair system on which to develop and test one. But they created it in a hurry, impressed Ed, and made the sale. After their first big success, the pair continued to develop programming language software for various systems. And not only did Ed agree to distribute their interpreter, but he also hired the two youngsters to maintain and improve it. Emboldened by the realization that there was indeed a way to turn his passion into a career, Bill officially dropped out of college, and together with Paul, he founded Microsoft one month later, in April 1975. Bill's bluff was risky, but as an entrepreneur, it's good to sometimes bite off a little more than you think you can chew. By always pushing yourself to deliver a little more than you've proven yourself capable of, you'll go further faster. That said, I don't recommend that you follow Bill's lead and straight up lie to your potential clients though. By the end of 1978, Microsoft sales topped over $1 million. Things were going well, and the duo's luck was far from over. Five years after setting up their company, they were approached by IBM, and the subsequent collaboration turned their computer business on its head and greatly increased Microsoft's power over the infant microcomputer industry. At the time, IBM was the world's biggest computer supplier and industry pace setter and after witnessing Microsoft's innovative work, it wanted to hire the boys to create an operating system for their upcoming personal computer, the IBM PC. The duo got to work, and they created the PC-DOS operating system, which they delivered to IBM in exchange for a one-time fee of $50,000. They called it MS-DOS. Soon enough, other computer companies also began relying on it, and although Microsoft's independence strained relations with IBM, Bill deftly manipulated the larger company so that it became permanently dependent on him for crucial software. Around this time, Paul left Microsoft after being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, only one of the founders was left, Bill. Ever the visionary, he was always on the lookout for the next big thing. And while MS-DOS had been revolutionary at the time of its making, it had no graphical interface. Bill knew this had to change. He began traveling around the US delivering seminars about how graphic interfaces were the operating systems of the future. But no matter how often he said it, it seemed like nobody believed him. Computer companies told him graphic interfaces would be too slow and that it would be difficult to write the software for them. And most of them were anything but enthusiastic when Microsoft began developing Windows 
in 1983. But in 1984, attitudes swiftly changed. That year, Apple launched the Macintosh and the device became the first commercially successful computer with a graphical user interface. All of a sudden, it was obvious to everyone that the future involved nifty features like icons, scroll bars, and menus. And within a few years, the market was flooded with graphical OS software. Luckily, Microsoft had begun working on Windows two years earlier. They managed to release Windows 1.0 in 1985, just a year after the Mac's success. This goes to show that if you have a revolutionary idea, you shouldn't worry if others don't get it yet. Start developing it now so that you'll be prepared when the time is right. The following year, Microsoft went public at $21 a share, raising a colossal $61 million, and by the late 80s, it had become one of the most powerful and profitable companies in history. During these years, Bill amassed a huge paper fortune, as he was Microsoft's largest individual shareholder, and within a decade, his net worth reached into the tens of billions of dollars. In 1996, Microsoft topped $2 billion in net income for the first time. And one reason for this massive success was Bill's ability to notice something important. The internet was here to stay. During the second half of the 1990s, internet usage became increasingly more popular. And although he had been somewhat late compared to other tech giants, by May 1995, Bill was so convinced that the internet was Microsoft's future that he wrote a long memo to his company. It included, The internet is a tidal wave. It changes the rules. It is an incredible opportunity as well as an incredible challenge. I am looking forward to your input on how we can improve our strategy to continue our track record of incredible success. Bill took the time to write this memo because he recognized how important it was for his whole team to be on board with Microsoft's mission. Sharing your vision not only directs others towards your goals, but it also increases engagement and trust. The internet had been a global paradigm shift, but more big changes were about to happen. After having built Microsoft up from the ground, Bill stepped down as its CEO, so that he could focus on other things. And together with his ex-wife, Melinda, he founded the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. With the new foundation, the couple hoped to enhance healthcare, reduce extreme poverty, and expand educational opportunities across the world. Speaking of his intentions, Bill once said, Money has no utility to me beyond a certain point. Its utility is entirely in building an organization and getting the resources out to the poorest in the world. At first, people from all over the globe applauded the couple's actions, but eventually, the general sentiment began to shift. After having remained on the Microsoft board for two decades, Bill resigned in March 2020, stating that he wanted to spend even more time on his philanthropic activities. When the foundation was first created, many people praised Bill and Melinda for their decision. The couple took private funding for global health to an unprecedented level, and they were applauded for encouraging other billionaires to do the same. Some headlines called them the most generous humans on earth. And when reading media coverage, it seemed like everybody loved them. But little by little, the criticism started to get louder. From the foundation's lack of transparency and its veto power over other global health institutions to its spending priorities, many became increasingly skeptical and COVID-19 hasn't helped their case either. Bill recently attracted criticism after expressing his reluctance in sharing COVID-19 vaccine tech with developing countries. While he cited security issues and said that it would be too expensive to share the vaccine patents, critics were quick to highlight the massive profits his foundation has had in the face of the pandemic. Add to that the fact that he already spoke about an upcoming pandemic 
in a 2015 TED Talk, and the conspiracy theories were ripe for the making. Some even went as far as saying that it was Bill himself who created the virus in a lab. In his talk, Bill warned that a pandemic would take place in the next decade and that it would kill over 30 million people in six months. Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. He also noted that the world needs to prepare for pandemics in the same way it prepares for war. Talk about an I told you so moment. Today, Microsoft is one of the most successful tech companies in history. With a market capitalization of over $1 trillion, its products are used by hundreds of millions of people every day, and its logo is one of the most recognized around the world. And while Bill is no longer the world's wealthiest man, he's still worth a whopping $133 billion US dollars. According to Forbes real-time billionaire ranking, he is now the fifth richest person in the world with only Mark Zuckerberg, Bernard Arnault, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos ahead of him. Bill's lower ranking is in part due to his recent divorce with his wife Melinda. After 27 years together, the pair split up, and after dividing their assets, a stock transfer from Bill to Melinda suddenly made her a lot richer, and him a little poorer. Keeping in mind that he's still worth over $130 billion, the word poorer should be taken with a rather big grain of salt. This was the story of Bill Gates, a true groundbreaking innovator. He has made some fundamental contributions to the world, both with the creation of Microsoft and his philanthropic foundation. What about you? Are you a supporter of Bill Gates and his foundation? Or are you more on the skeptical side? Share your opinions in the comments.